Thank you, thank you very much, Bhaskar, Administrator of Medical Partial Association. Uh, uh, I'll just take a few minutes to give you a background to the series of lectures that the Medical Partial Association has been holding. Uh, I would be grateful if all people who are not talking uh, or who are officially not speaking to mute their audio so that there are no disturbances. Uh, I want to, on my personal behalf, welcome all the people who are part participating in this program physically at the Medical Partial Association Auditorium, as well as uh, various uh, friends of Medical Partial Association from different parts of the world. Uh, uh, as far as uh, Scotland on one side and New Zealand on the other side, a large number of people from different parts of India. I want to also welcome you know, the her Department of Psychiatric Social Work demands where I see a lot of people are sitting in their lecture hall. I want to especially welcome some of our old staff, such as Babita, uh, some of our uh, uh, members, present and past, and uh, also people in India, very well known for their interest in uh, psychosocial rehabilitation. Not only our MPS life member, Dr. T. Murli, who recently gave up his position as the World Association of Psychosocial Rehabilitation President. I also see Dr. CRS, Dr. Ram Subramaniam, who is a, a well-known uh, uh, person in India who is interested in psychosocial rehabilitation for persons with uh, chronic severe mental disorders. Now, Medical Partial Association, the idea began as the doctor clergy group at the St. Mark's Cathedral in Bangalore in the mid-1960s, but then it evolved further, became a secular organization and uh, was registered as a medical partial association. The first non-governmental organization in India uh, devoted fully to uh, mental illness, the mentally ill, the adult mentally ill. Before that, there were, you know, there were some uh, 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 mental subnormality organizations focusing on the children. But for the adult mentally ill, this was the very first uh, non-governmental organization in India. And it was registered on the 3rd August 1972. And uh, now this is 50 years. On 3rd August 2022, we would complete 50 years. But the managing committee of the Medical Partial Association decided that this is a very important uh, uh, event, the Golden Jubilee year. And they said that, uh, you know, the Golden Jubilee observance should go on from uh, February of uh, 2022 to February of 2023, almost here, year long. You can, of course, have a kind of ongoing celebration. So what was decided was that there will be uh, a series of monthly lectures by people who have been friends uh, of Medical Pastoral Association, who have contributed to Medical Pastoral Association, who have been involved or associated with Medical Partial Association in various ways, but themselves luminaries in the field of mental health, both in India and overseas. So this is the third. Uh, the second lecture was by the director of the Schizophrenia Research Foundation, a very close ally and friend of Medical Partial Association, the SCAR, its current director, Dr. Padmavati. Last year, last month was March. It was also 8th of March was the International Women's Day. So we also use the occasion to felicitate two of our past secretaries, women secretaries, Dr. Gladys Sumitra and Dr. Uh, Mrs. Tilaka. So this is the third in a series of 12 lectures that we hope to have as part of the Golden Jubilee Observance. And we have a very internationally recognized person, Dr. R. Srinivasamurthy. I will formally introduce him later on. Uh, but this is a little background to the Medical Partial Association's uh, 
uh, Golden Jubilee. We run various kinds of rehabilitation facilities. Medical Pastoral uh, Association runs a suicide prevention helpline in Bangalore and a number of other things. So we are so delighted that so many of you have logged in, so many of you have actually physically come to the Medical Pastoral Association. And uh, some of our members who are not in Bangalore have logged in from other places. We are also delighted one of our old-time friend and Belvisha, Lorna, from Scotland has logged in. Uh, and uh, so, uh, once again, my uh, hearty welcome to all of you. And this is a little background to the Medical Pastoral Associations to Golden Jubilee celebrations. Back to you, Bhaskar. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, now, I would request uh, our ex-secretary, this is Ramona to briefly introduce our speaker. And after that, uh, in detail, Dr. Kumar Isaac will be presented. It is actually a great pleasure that I've been given this privilege of introducing Dr. Srinivas Murthy. Professor uh, Srinivas Murthy was born in 1947 at Kalukan Mysore district of Karnataka. He studied medicine at CMC by law, 1964-72. He completed his post-graduation in psychiatry and worked 10 years in PGI Chandigarh, 72 to 1981. He was at Nimhans from 1982 to 2003 and retired as professor of psychiatry. He worked with WHO from 2010 uh, 2000 to 2001 at Geneva and 2004-2007 at military offices of the Eastern Mediterranean regions, countries of region like Sudan, Iran. Following retirement in 2008, he is assisting voluntary organizations. He is currently working on developing self-care material for emotional health, for personal living, persons living with diagnosis of cancer and caregivers of, uh, of developmental disabilities. We are pleased to have his wife with us, Mrs. Radha, who is also a social worker. Welcome to you both. I will be feeling in my duty Padma and here that Dr. Srinivas Murthy has been of a tremendous help to many go pastoral association, especially in the years that I was here on the board. And also, I will not fail to mention that he did a, a lot of work during the Manakwada earthquake and debriefing people, helping people, including my own daughter. So thank you, sir. Thank you for coming, and we welcome you. Um, sir, uh, now the goodness of uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy sir is that you know, he has written only a little bit about what he has done and he has sent it to us. So what Ramona Ma'am gave, as I said, is a brief about sir. But Dr. Mohan Isaac sir, who is associated with sir, uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy for a long time, I think so will be the right person to tell more about Dr. Srinivas Murthy. Dr. Mohan Isaac sir, over there. Thank you, Thank you. Bhaskar. Uh, of course, it is indeed a great pleasure to uh, talk about Dr. Murthy because we have an uh, association of about 40 years. Uh, you know, we have worked together, we have traveled together, we have done things together in different parts of the country, not only in the US. So I'll fill in some of the gaps, uh, of, uh, you know, from what Ramola said. Now, during the 60s, uh, it was mentioned that Dr. Srinivas Murthy studied in Christian Medical College, Vellore. That is indeed true. But what uh, she did not say, and what perhaps a lot of people don't know, is that Christian Medical College being one of the topmost colleges in India, being a non-sponsored candidate, that is not sponsored by any of the supporting churches, as many of you know, Christian Medical College is supported by various supporting church organizations, and uh, 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 those days, out of 50 seats, 35 seats were for people who were sponsored by various churches, who were obligated to go back, you know, they sign a bond and go back and serve the churches. Only 15 seats were available for people 
on open competitions. Anybody, anybody in the country. The best in the country that year who wanted to do medicine in the best college, one of the best colleges. And Dr. Murthy from Kollegal, he studied there. He studied in St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, pre university course. And he was one of those 15 brightest young men who uh, applied to join Christian Medical College and then got selected. So he had that CMC training, uh, probably many of his uh, uh, ideas which uh, guided his work in future may have been uh, developed from there. Now, the second thing is EGI, of course, is a great institute, the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research. But another thing which is not very well known, which I know is that uh, the year he passed out his MD in psychiatry, he was the best outgoing student, not just in psychiatry. Out of four or five, the best outgoing student in psychiatry is no big deal. He was the best outgoing student of all departments who passed out the three-year MD, MS program. Then, of course, he joined the Department of Psychiatry there. And it was a few years later that he came to Bangalore, Nimans, his home uh, uh, state, Karnataka. And ever since, in, he came in 1982. And I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Murthy a number of things, the National Mental Health Program, the Community uh, Psychiatry Unit, Sakalwara, the Bellari District Program, etc., etc., a number of things. Till he was, I had the privilege to take over from him as the head of the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, you know, he was the head for a number of years. And when he went to WHO, uh, uh, taking up assignments, higher assignments, I had the privilege to take over from him. He was the editor of the World Health Report on mental health in 2001. Then, of course, after finishing assignments, he came back to India. And he has been uh, working, helping the Association for the Physically Handicapped uh, uh, in uh, Bangalore. And as uh, Pramola said, he's developing uh, uh, material for helping carers. So it is indeed a great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Murthy to deliver this uh, third lecture. The only regret is that just until two days ago, three days ago, I was in Bangalore. I was looking forward to welcoming him, him in the auditorium of Medical Pastoral Association. But my department here in Perth uh, wanted me frantically back. They said, now why are you staying back? Australia has opened its uh, borders. The flights are again running. And uh, I had some time back, several uh, months ago, said after Easter, I'll be coming back. So I had to come. And unfortunately, I am attending this program and I'm welcoming introducing Dr. Murthy virtually. Uh, but that is okay. Seeing uh, Dr. Goyal and Dr. Lona from different corners of the world, I'm not very upset about it. So it is my great pleasure to uh, invite Dr. Murthy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. R. Murthy to give the third Golden Jubilee Lecture for huh? Medical Pastoral Association. Back to you, uh, Dr. Murthy. Sir, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, just before we go to the detailed talk of uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, sir, uh, we would like Dr. Srinivas Murthy, sir, to please come on the stage. And I would request Dr. Joseph George, our president, and our executive, Mr. Pramola, ma'am, to do the honors for Dr. R. Srinivas Murthy. Big round of applause, please. I would also request Radha ma'am to come on the stage as well. Please, please ma'am, please. Thank you, sir, for that.
brought to I feel almost overwhelmed by the generosity and uh, the love expressed by Mohan and all of you on this occasion. Uh, thank you very much. And as we get the laptop uh, in this one, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Joseph George, the President of the MPA, and all the members of MPA and all those who have come here, also who are joining us online for uh, honoring me by being uh, with us this evening. You know, this is a very special month to talk about spirituality. We had the Easter, we had the Ramadan going on, you know, Ramadan is a very, very important uh, one. Then we had Ram Naomi, we had Ugadi, yesterday we had Take Gaudur, 400 years celebration. What more could we ask to talk about spirituality than this particular thing? I also want to especially thank Mohan and the team for choosing this, this topic rather than the other topics like uh, mental health, mental illness, rehabilitation and other things because as Mohan wrote in his email this is a topic very few people talk about in professional circles and I hope to leave you by the end of the next 45 minutes to rethink your own thinking on spirituality my own assessment of spirituality and mental health is Spirituality is the cultural resource for mental health which is available to each one of us if we decide to use it. Something similar to the solar energy. Solar energy is there everywhere but if you put a solar cell immediately you can have hot water, you can have electricity, you can do all sorts of things. I personally think that what we have in the spirituality is this one. And I will do this by two or three methods. One, I will share with you a couple of personal experiences in the last 40 years, what makes me say that spirituality is so important. Secondly, obviously in an organization like this, we will look at some scientific evidence to look at spirituality and mental health. More important than that, I also want to spend a little time why we have used this term neglected resource of India and go on to share with you what we can do at the level of individuals, families, communities and professionals to make spirituality an essential integral part of mental health care. You now if you look at the slogan just there, the words hope, concern, guidance, sharing, all of them are spiritual terms. I don't need to say more. Similarly, if you look at the logo of Enhance, Samadva Yoga Uchayate, it says equanimity is the goal of all existence. So there is no reason for us to think that spirituality is not important. But at the same time, as Mohan pointed out, very often we are afraid to talk about it, use it, utilize it and make it grow up in the country and give it to the rest of the world. Of course, we will immediately say yoga and meditation, we have done it, but there is a much bigger, like my teacher used to say, is to say, you know, oh, why are you happy with the few petals when the whole garden is there? You know, something similar to that, spirituality is like a garden which can perfume everywhere in the world and I will come to that in a minute. Very briefly, the reason why I gave a very brief one was I thought it would be easier to talk uh, without too much of a personal uh, glorification which often happens in our uh, Indian meetings. I have born a Hindu, had 10 years of growing up in a Christian community in Bello, 10 years of living with Sikhism and its uh, great traditions in uh, Chandigarh, learned about Islam and Judaism in uh, Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, visited Israel and Palestine more than once and of course have been working with disaster populations which really stimulated me to think of spirituality as an important part of life in general, mental health in particular. Before I go further, I also want to share a special relationship that I have with UTC. One of my classmates, Usha Samar, 
is the daughter of Professor Samar, who used to be a professor of religion, history of religion at UTC for a long time. Similarly, another friend of mine, classmate of mine, has written a fantastic uh, uh, religious article, an unexpected gift in one of the Christian journals, talking about her son, who is now 46 years old, severely disabled, who taught her what spirituality is all about. This article about 12 pages now is really fantastic. I just read out one line. To care for a person with disability, there needs to be transitioning of the mind that comes from the heart. Then she goes on to quote many Christian things. In the 12 pages, you see her every crisis being responded to using the spiritual resource. And a remarkable couple, Keith and the, the Madhu and the Keith Gavin and their child. I also want to recall the 150 years of Arvindo, Sri Arvindo, by quoting one line which is very important for mental health. Pain is the key that opens the gates of strength. Pain is the key that opens the gates of strength. It is the high road that leads to the city of victory. What a beautiful one from the Savitri. Right this week, there is a whole week of Savitri Jagar going on in the in this area. More than anything else, you will hear a little bit more about it in detail. Recently, two weeks back or two months back, the ex director of National Institute of Mental Health in America, who retired a couple of years back, gave, has written a book called Healing Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. I will tell you a little bit more about it. As part of his presentation, you have the link in the handout, he says, He who has a way, why can live without almost any harm? Further, one of his colleagues, Marshall Lady Han, says, If you want to reduce suicide, give people something to live for. What more can you find than spirituality to live for? That is the running theme of my presentation. Of course, we Indians play pride of our spirituality. As Dalai Lama said, India should share its love and share knowledge. And we are doing it in yoga meditation, but there is a lot more that needs to be done. I am not the first person who is talking about the, this topic. There are a large number of people, I am sorry, it is a little upset now. Large number of people who have talked about it. Professor Abraham Bandis, a friend of the MPA, talked about spirituality and mental health in 2008 in the Indian General Psychiatry. I will tell you a little bit more about that. Then the president of the Indian Psychiatry Society, Dr. Bolecha, chose that as a topic for his uh, presentation. Professor Vikram Rao, Professor Daniel Dick, earlier Dr. M. B. Swami, and as I was mentioning earlier, Dr. Anna Ha, a friend of India, a Swiss psychiatrist, has written a beautiful book on Hippocrates and Heretic, talking about her religious contact, being a Christian and living in a Hindu country, what it meant to her. And Dr. Bisht, who took the idea of spirituality to WHO in 1985. And Dr. Sajjaran talked about positive mental health. Number of people have talked about it. So, what I am talking about it is bringing those ideas to you in a condensed manner, not that I am saying anything new by myself. In the recent times, we just lost Avdeh Sharma, fantastic spiritual leader, who brought out this book of spirituality and mental health in 2009. Another couple of Indian psychiatrists like uh, Dilip Jaste, Dinesh Bukra, all have written, Manoj Sharma, have all written about the spirituality of India and its relevance to Western world. Particularly interesting is the book of Madhu Bhartika Sharma, who has written a beautiful book on anxiety and basic wisdom, and I mentioned that in the beginning also. Sorry, you can't come in there? Start doing that? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. If you want to hand it to yourself, I don't need it. Okay. So, uh, the question against which I want to talk about spirituality is the crisis of mental health. There is a real crisis of mental health. I will show you some things which will uh, shock you what is happening in America. That at this moment, 
everyone is confused what we should be doing about mental health as many of these recent books have shown. But our ambivalence towards spirituality to mental health has been there as recent as 40 years back. Dr. Carstairs, a British psychiatrist of uh, tremendous eminence as well as a friend of India had this to say in a, in a cautious manner as he said at 1980, he said one has to He had this to say What did I leave it to you to handle? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. He said, one has to admit that there is little firm evidence that either meditation or religious observance significantly modifies tens of thousands of Indians, young and old, have become disciples of teachers who support them, but we don't have any evidence. And he goes on to say, if it could be established that with appropriate controls, the changes in the symptoms and personality do come, from yoga, meditation and other things, it will be a great contribution. Similarly, Dr. Rambo Brown said about uh, 10 years later, 15 years later, India is an ancient, cultural, spiritual, anthropological laboratory. Nevertheless, to be satisfied with the glory of the past is to turn the wisdom into a fossil. He calls for the theme of my talk, interpret the world from a new point of view, is to revitalize the past and bring in a fresh life into the current world. So what we need to do is not keep talking about the glory of the Vedas or Upanishads or anything else, but to convert it into a thing which will like the current world. All over the world, as you see when the next time comes, you see that the interest in spirituality is coinciding with the starting of the MPA in 1972. In the graph, you see that almost no publications were there in 72. Now it has gone up sky high. This was the 2012 data. Now it has gone up still further. Yesterday, when I googled, when I PubMed Central, they showed 12,000 articles and 10,000 of them in the last 10 years itself. So it's a, it's a huge area where everyone is giving a lot of people. Now, the question that you will ask me is if Spirituality is so important. Has it been tested out by the pandemic? After all, pandemic affected all of us. If it is something which is useful, is there any evidence for us to think that it happens? David Sridhar, who works in Edinburgh, just published this uh, book, How a Pandemic Preventable. He has this statement to make For humanity, the challenge now is to take up open wounds of the COVID 19 that has been exposed and build a better world moving forward. This is a challenge for the whole world and I am suggesting to you humbly that by using spirituality, by making spirituality an everyday part of our life, we can achieve this goal. But I will come to that a little later. Before that, let's talk a little bit about mental health. Mental health is in a crisis. Many of you would have heard about the Lancet Commission on Depression, which was published in February 22. Lancet is publishing another commission report in September on stigma and discrimination. Two months back, there was a major paper on public mental health in Lancet. You all know about the, the inclusion of mental health in the budget of 2022 by Sitaraman, Nirmala Sitaraman, and 23 centers to come up. The current is editorial of the Indian General of Psychiatry talks about public mental health and the Chandigarh has been recently designated as a public mental health center and the setting up of the global center for traditional medicine by WHO with something like 2000 crores being put by Indian government, 250 million dollars is indication that there is something everyone is looking for. But we have a crisis. As this psychologist from uh, uh, Australia says, Western consumer culture is creating a psycho spiritual crisis that leaves us disoriented, bereft of purpose. How can we treat our sick culture and make ourselves well? Similarly, 
This was the headline of a, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association published uh, this week. Push to the limit one in five physicians tend to leave practice and says, I am burned out. What we are looking for is healing. Just imagine people talking about healing as a term if they would like to talk about again and again. The most important is the next one. This is uh, Thomas Hinsel. He was director of National Institute of Medical Health till a few years back. He has published on the February 22nd of this year this book, Healing Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. It's a fantastic book. And his uh, uh, YouTube is there in your uh, handout. The link is there. Please do take time to see it. The point he makes it, I borrowed this title from him since it was available in public uh, domain. He says, there is a crisis in behavioral health. America, which has something like 700,000 mental health professionals, that is 400 times that of India, not 400 percent, 400 times that of India population wise, is not able to address mortality in terms of prevalence, lack of employment, housing, incarceration, lower life expectancy, and poverty. And he makes a point that. I'm really sorry about this. If I can get rid of this, it will make it easier. Yeah, yeah, next one, please. So, what, what he points is saying that all other things, whether it is childhood leukemia, even AIDS, heart disease, stroke, all of them have come down. There is a better prognosis while the suicide has gone. Drug abuse, induced deaths. In America, every day, 100 people are dying of drug abuse, overdose. Today, drug abuse is a crisis of the mind as well as the spirit. Similarly, it talks about the lower life expectancy of the mentally ill, low employment, high incarceration, and he says the solution is people place purpose. People in terms of strengthening the people, place in terms of decreasing the discrimination, like childhood experience, poverty, racism, and other things. Much more than that, he says the most important thing that we need is a feeling of purpose. The slide that I started off with, that we need to give back to the people a purpose to their life other than the material things, which is spirituality, in my understanding of it. Then he talks about that we have unprecedented progress in neuroscience and behavioral science and technology. We have effective interventions, yet outcomes are no better. The reason is that we have medical solutions, but the solutions have to be social, environmental, political, and I would add spiritual. I will tell you why I am adding that one and I will let you know. One of the activities that I took up with the Mohan, dear friend, was with the Mohan. As you will see when the slide comes up, you will see that uh, we wrote a manual in 1987. Mohan, Ajit Gede, who is very closely associated with MBA, we all wrote a manual. Next one. 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 So what happened in Bhopal? It, it, it really illustrates spirituality in the true sense of the word. I want you to give me a minute to talk about it. The disaster occurred in December 2, 3, 9. No psychiatrist was there for the next uh, two months. There was not even a single psychiatrist in any of the medical colleges of Madhya Pradesh. There were five medical colleges. Bhopal did not have a psychiatrist at that time. And after two months, because people were coming in large numbers to the medical centers, they called us, Dr. Sethi and myself, to see what is happening. And we went, we studied, and we coined a term called wounded bodies and wounded minds. Wounded bodies because the respiratory problem, eye problem was very prominent. We said there is a wounded mind. Then, because there were no psychiatrists, Dr. Mohan, myself, uh, Ajit Bide, Dr. Chandrasekhar, we wrote up this manual and trained the doctors and got the mental health program going. For 20 years, the ICMR left Bhopal to the state government, and after the Supreme Court judgment in 2010, 
the feedback. I see my feedback and they invited me to go back and I used to spend one, one, one day every month for nearly three, four, four years and reassess the problem. When we reassess the problem, it's one thing. When we reassess the problem, we saw something which was shocking. Even after 30 years, people were suffering. This time it was not only this physical suffering that had disappeared. Eyes were normal, lungs were damaged, but they were able to get out. But there was a spiritual loss. I am dramatizing it with one example. This gentleman had been continuously ill for 30 years. A Muslim gentleman, he was a national hockey player, and the staff brought him to me, saying that, please, when I saw him, I said, this person is severely depressed, suicidal, I want to admit him. He said, no, I won't get admitted. I will come every day and see you, but I will not get admitted. I said, okay, what else I can do? I started seeing him, and the field staff used to sit with me to see how I provide help in this one. After that, she wrote this beautiful poem. Uh, the left side is about the disaster, the right side is worth reading it, and uh, I want to read it saying that first kept awaiting them to come across or be gifted by some. Then lands an angel one day in his life who falls him gently into the meaning of living, having found verily the care is about. He gradually let go of all his grief, responding to his sincere words of love. He laid wide open the gates of his heart, and lo and behold, he was right there with him, having redeemed his uh, real self all over again. I mean, it's almost like a Christian, I mean, if you can use my Bellur days, Christian uh, uh, type of a revival. And we saw many number of them. It's just one of them and written by one of the staff. Similarly, this is an iconic picture similar to Python in the St. Peter's uh, Church. Because this is Father Michael Church, who was a priest working with the fire brigade in 9-11 in New York. When the towers came down, they didn't know what was going to happen. For the first fire brigade movement, he was part of it. Because in fire brigade, there is a spiritual person all the time to go with them to provide support. Unfortunately, he was the first person to die, and that's the ironic nature of it. Equally important, three years later, when a nationwide survey was made of the psychological problems of people after the disaster, the 9 11 disaster in 2001, they found a striking difference between those who are spiritual and those who are not spiritual, the people who are spiritual had less psychological mental health problems than those who were not spiritual. That was the biggest proof that you can get in a natural event with the general population. Similarly, the, yeah. Similarly, the findings, and there is a large number of studies, I will just tell you about the next one. Uh, three studies which have been reported which are good one. The first one is from Wuhan, China. Uh, in the first phase of the lockdown, they studied people to look at people who are using psychological methods like flow, mindfulness, flow is living in the present, and found that those who are using this had less effect of the lockdown and the restrictions. Similarly, in another Indian study, this was done by the Vivekananda Yoga Center, Google uh, uh, survey of a uh, uh, large number of people from all over India. Again, they found that those who were using yoga and meditation had less effect of the lockdown and all the restrictions that went with the COVID-19. Similarly, another study came out last month from Malaysia, where again the COVID fever was less in those who are spiritual, religious, compared with the ones who are not spiritual and religious. Now these studies are very important because these are not studies with a select population with the general population. So there is enough evidence to say when you are going through a difficult period, then you have this problem. The third story I want to tell you is my own story. Forgive me for that. 2013, I developed cancer. I was diagnosed with colon cancer, stage 3, I had to have surgery, chemotherapy, it was a terrible experience. 
but it opened up a completely new window of life for me. No, no for me. Because I realized more than the fear, more than the treatment, the question that I was asking was, what is the meaning of life? How do I find a purpose when I know there is an uncertainty in front of me? Whether I am going to live for six months, one year, or two years, or nine years like now, and I have to look for spiritual solutions. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Reddy, Narayan Reddy, the former director, was very, very kind to me, introduced me to Sri Aravindo and personally guided me and I discovered. Then I decided that I must do something for people living with cancer. I started a blog post called uh, Living with Cancer and started an activity called My Emotional Health, My Choice. And I identified these 10 things, 5 things you can do to maintain your mental health. Exercise, sleep, nutrition, yoga meditation, and being connected. Five things you can do when you are distressed. Share your feelings, journaling, music, thinking differently, spiritual. Then I started providing honorary service to Sri Shankara Cancer Hospital and also to the Vivekananda Youth Movement in Mysore Palliative Care Center. And then I found that spirituality is the core of the experience of majority of the people. Let me just give you three or four stories. One patient was having severe pain and I said, how do you handle it? She smiled and said, remarkable lady, you know. Uh, she said, look, I am like Ramana Mahashi. Ramana Mahashi, when he was asked, do you have pain? He said, my body has pain, I don't have pain. The same thing which uh, Ramakrishna also said when he had throat cancer or uh, JK who had also uh, cancer. The second story was a lady with breast cancer, stage 4. We had palliative care only, nothing much to offer. And I always ask this question, how do you live with this? How do you make sense? She said, Doctor, I dream every day Sundarkanda. Sundarkanda is a section of uh, Ramayana where Sita is in uh, Lanka and Hanuman goes and meets her and brings hope. And when I read this, my pain, my suffering disappears and I see hope and I live with it. Another very senior professor in one of the colleges with the, again severe breast cancer, subsequently ovarian cancer. Every day she said, I read, uh, uh, the, I read religious texts and I see stories like Parikshit, who when you are told one week more you have before you die because of something which he does to your sage. He decided that I will not enjoy things, I will not do this or that. He went out to Varanasi. He lived with the sages, he read the religious things, and then uh, passed away. So I can tell you any number. The fourth one, which was told by the staff, I was not personally involved in it, was uh, a Muslim uh, gentleman with the terminal cancer. When he was told that you have a short time, he said, I don't want to stay in the hospital. He went home, he declared that he's got cancer and he's going to die. After we became, he began a jatra type of a thing, he celebrated his life before dying and so it's possible to use spirituality as a way of dealing with the life. So I am quite convinced that when you have a serious problem, you have the novelty crisis, you have the reality crisis, but more than that you have the value crisis, that is the crisis of spirituality. And if someone can reach out to you to activate your spiritual resources, you will find peace, you will move from struggle to surrender and serenity. Next slide please. I am coming to the end of uh, this uh, illustration and come to some hardcore uh, medicine, hardcore uh, evidence. The last example I want to give you is something which we are doing right now in Bangalore. This program is called Enrich, that is we are recognizing that caregivers of people with the special children have anything between two to five times more emotional health problems and physical health problems, which is very well documented all over the world. We said we develop what we develop for cancer for parent caregivers of uh, children with special uh, children. Our organization, Association for Mental Channeling, is 10 years younger than you, that's about 60 years old. And what we do is we bring together a group of seven, eight people. We don't bring together a big group like this. We just bring together a group. They have a 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock 
workshop to listen to them, to give them the skills of self care, five five things, and also develop a plan for themselves. There are two young girls, Divya and Nishita, who work with me, two young psychologists. And uh, when I told them they must look at spirituality, sad, they can't do that, it's very difficult. But I encouraged them, did some interviews, and lo and behold, what they said is, what we found was enormous outpouring of information, experiences, much more than what we imagined. They all came forward to talk about their spirituality much more easily than anything else. And they all had different, different. Some looked at it as a gift, some looked at it as an opportunity to uh, understand God, some, of course, thought of it as a uh, punishment for what they have done in the thing. But by and large, we found that parents were very, very important and parents were using spirituality as an important resource to make sense and find a path in their life. You know, we have a little talk and I will be happy to share this with you. Next time. Okay, now I have given you a lot of nice anecdotal things, tell you stories. But is there good evidence to show that spirituality does make a difference? The evidence is overwhelming. I will come to the mental health in a minute. Whether you are talking about people who have had an open heart surgery, if they were spiritual before the surgery, they are more likely to live longer. If people are on chronic renal dialysis, if they are spiritual, they are likely to have less complications, live longer. Even in HIV, in California, a lady just taught them some nonsense, I mean, anonymous mantra, and that increased the immunity, and their response to the antiviral drugs was better, the side effects were less, and they live longer. I can go on and go on and talk about it. But in this specific area of mental health, there is an excellent paper by Dr. Honey, uh, I, uh, which is available in the, for easy download, 600 references, 20 pages long, shows that there is enough evidence to indicate benefits in terms of coping with adversity, positive emotions, well-being and happiness, hope, optimism, meaning and purpose, self-esteem, self-control, positive character. All of these things are well documented from a handful to 30, 40 studies for each one of these areas. Similarly, next time. Similarly, in the area of disorders, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, personality traits, substance abuse, in all of these things, three things come. Number one, spirituality is a very important part of the sense making of the people. Spirituality gives a better outcome for these people. Spirituality is has a better, sorry, better outcome and the person acceptance and illness is greater. The best evidence is from schizophrenia in India. You all know in 1980 there was a five year follow up of schizophrenia by uh, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research headed by Professor uh, uh, Abraham Bernays and uh, he found that among the big group in uh, Lucknow, Goa, and, uh, Lucknow, uh, Delhi and the Bangalore, sorry, Vellore, they found that those who are spiritual had a better outcome than those without their spiritual background. So it is evidence from the international area, from the Indian area. Next time. Similarly, it also decreases social issues like marriage, instability, increases social support, social capital, and delinquency crime. All of this is very well documented and uh, some areas, I will, I will come to that in a minute. For example, forgiveness related references are more than 700. More than 700 papers showing that forgiveness, even in a severe condition like cancer, increases the survival, decreases the side effects of the chemotherapy, radiotherapy and other things and gives better quality of life. Now you will ask me, how does spirituality work? You know, it's so ethereal. It is like the sunlight, you have talked about it. How does it get converted into electricity or hot water? It is through five or six things. Number one, the fellowship field. Connectedness. You remember we talked about connectedness being very, very important as a mental health parameter. In point of fact, 
Vivek Murthy, I think so he's a book in the Vivek, who is the second general of uh, uh, America, has written a book called Together, showing that being connected is one of the most important mental health uh, preventive mechanisms. Number two, you tend to use more health promoting activities. Then you will feel the distress much less because you are not personalizing the distress, you are seeing it. Like my friend Madhu Gaman and Keith Gaman, who use church and the Bible and their belief system to understand the difficulty, the challenges they had with uh, their son Aju and the last 40 years. They continue to have for the last 46 years. More than that, it leads to activities like gratitude. Compassion, kindness, uh, service, humor, you know, all of these are very positive things, next slide please, uh, which are the components of it. That is, connection to the superpower, prayer, gratitude, forgiveness, kindness, humility, compassion, humor, acceptance, and various things. Now, these, each one of them alone is very effective. Together, they are dynamic to address any challenge that comes in front of you. Those of you who want to see evidence for that, read the Book of Joy by Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. You know, they have given both scientific evidence and the spiritual evidence for the same. And what is very striking in the way we look at it in Eastern countries and the West, in the West, what happens is they pick up any one of them, like integrity or anything and make a whole thing out of it. While in India we tend to think of the whole thing in a composite manner, in a totality manner and don't go on to convert it into an activity. For example, forgiveness is not just a mechanical thing. For example, one group has worked in this uh, forgiveness, Ramona Pete has been some of the very interesting uh, material from her church and her experience. He says there are only four things to be done with the forgiveness. Identify the unforgiveness within you. Do the forgiveness. Then work through to undo the things so that you give back something to the society. And by doing this, you will find a relief, and that relief gets converted into better health in terms of immunity and all the other things that go. And each one of them, each one of them, if you see, for example, this book of forgiveness is. I mean, full of stories. Sometimes even you think, you know, could it be true? And as I said, I have read enough to say all of this is true. And this is where we are missing in India. In India, we present whether Sri Aurobindo or Vivekananda or uh, Chinmaya or anyone else or Christianity or anything as a package rather than as an activity. That is the challenge, I will come to that in a minute uh, uh, and the present. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next slide, the same one. Yeah. Now, I just want to tell you one uh, study which was done in Duke University called Business Based Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Do you know cognitive behavior therapy is thought of as one of the biggest progress in mental health of the last 50 years? This study which was done at Duke University did it with the five NESPAC, five religious groups, yes, right? And uh, the yes, yes, yes. they worked with the Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. They looked at each one of the religious texts and developed their cognitive behavior therapy based on that for Hinduism. <coughs> Nani Chitani did this work from uh, California. And she took Bhagavad Gita, Krishna and Arjuna dialogue, and how the cognition of Arjuna was changed by Krishna. 5000 years back, or 2500 years back, and we are talking about CPT being a big revolution in the last few And it's a fantastic uh, thing, all of this will be given the next time, so that CPT and RCPT were both acceptable and equally effective. In some ways, it's better than others, but it was a very successful study. And all of the manuals, all of the resources are available pro bono. You can go there next time, uh, and uh, you can go there and find it. And uh, if anyone of you have difficulty, write to me, I'll send it to you. 
So it is no more a hunky panky something which is happening in the behind the curtain or something which is uh, done in like a magic kind of black magic. It is hard process. This year, sometime in January, February, there is a major paper showing the psychological interventions have biological variables at the level of immunity in terms of IL-6, T-cells, T-cells and all of these type of things. And I think you are going to hear a lot more of uh, the biological basis of spirituality than what we have heard so far in this area. Next slide. Now, philosophy, it's all very nice, but is there anything more that you can offer from spirituality? I am entering into a very dangerous territory by putting my neck out and saying that India is capable of addressing some universal problems with a unique Indian way of looking at it. What is that? Aging, loneliness. It is the biggest child. One third of Americans are thought to be lonely. Loneliness is thought to be worse than uh, obesity and smoking. And everyone is thinking of, like in this uh, model of the PHO, better health services, better living condition, better environment. But no one talks about a spiritual way of looking at it. Next time. I go back to uh, the, this uh, that's the book of uh, Vivek Murthy, again a fantastic book on healing next time. My teacher, Professor Renanthi from Chandigarh, wrote this article, Relevance of Manaprasta Ashram in Modern Times. What is this Manaprasta? He said, Murthy, there is no way you can overcome old age, loneliness, which is an essential part of growing old. You cannot look at it as a loss. Then I said, what can be done then? Think of it as a transition. Hinduism, one of the biggest contributions of Hinduism, as far as Arthur Brooks, who is a columnist of Atlantic magazine, came all the way to listen to Nachur Metropolitan in Malakar about this Varaprasta. Uh, uh, what is it that Arthur said? Four things you do as part of Varaprasta. Withdraw from the outside as much as possible. Give away as much as possible. Give your services free to people. Turn four, turn towards God and find a purpose and meaning in life. If you do this, then old age is no more a problem. It is a relief. It is a transition. And this, if it can be operationalized, systematized and shared and demonstrated that this is the easier, less expensive, more effective, they are looking at old age. Think about it. Think about it. If you can do that, that could save trillions of rupees that is being spent on old age homes and all sorts of things. Because in America, one third of the medical care occurs in the last one year of life. One third of it in the last one year of life. Here is an opportunity for some young people to take it out and say, I will do something based on the Varaprasta concept. Not necessarily going to the forest, but building that ideas and saying, finding peace with it. It is a question of finding peace rather than anything. That's right. Similarly, we have a challenge of grief. Do you know when you look at PubMed, you will find about 12,000 to 13,000 articles on grief, grief therapy. When I put grief therapy in India, it was zero. This particular one was an article written by Dr. Necky in 1977. I recently looked at the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. There is not a single intervention article on grief in the last 70 years of Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Except recently there is one from Prabhachandra in the COVID that past year, just a descriptive one. Why is it? The reason is not that we are not interested. The reason is we have an inbuilt grief management mechanism. That is, rituals, systems of support, even simple things like not cooking for 10 11 days, someone bringing food, eating with you, not wearing new clothes, reading every day, business texts, you can go on and on. All of these are good for mental health, good for accepting the loss of a loved one, and it is there within us. And we take it for granted like the sunshine and not think about it. 
next time i talked to the end of it this is malu kapoor who is a friend of mpa has written a fantastic book last year called it is okay to reach out for help for lay people about the cultural uh, religious spiritual and self care mechanism it's a fantastic book i would recommend it to all of you from childhood to adolescent to old age she has examples of how we can use our resources to address the large problems in the community next slide please now i'm coming to the end of it you will say that murti is all very nice what does it mean to me as ordinary individual as a member of the mpa stay here the first thing that i want to say to you please look with it you have an enormous amount of resource with it i'm not talking in a philosophical manner that when you look inside the energy that you have is much much more than what is outside so we all are capable of recovering using our own internal strength second look around and see what religious spiritual resources that you have acquired from your childhood from your family from your community and try to build it you know gratitude compassion kindness journaling reading a religious text attending a church or a temple or a mosque all of these things are beneficial to you and will help you recover faster decrease the side effects and give you a better quality so if you are an individual looking for it make spirituality an important part of you something like your shadow let it be sitting on your shoulder so that you can okay, put it out whenever you need next slide at the family level and community level we all need to build connectedness through small networks religious networks belief networks are reaching out to help each other do you know during the covid among the elderly if people kept in touch with other people they did better than those who did not keep in touch or those people who went out even to the park or to the mall or something did better but this is all well documented thing so please think of your life as a life of community not life of the self individual i i i rather than teach the children work with the community so that you are together in this way next slide please as a professional very very important i can't better than what professor varghi uh, said in his article in 2008 in the indian journal of psychiatry next slide please he said these are the things that he identified six i have added a couple of them more all of us need to examine our religion spirituality no one religion is superior or inferior or better or this one all religions have this connected with the bigger force and the good of the community there we need to examine the concept in different religions document it make it easy for ordinary people to use for example when i tell the story i i remember uh, let me just tell you one more story so this lady came to me about 30 years back when i was working in the bank with severe depression what was the problem her brother had a chronic kidney failure what to bellow those days bellow had the days they went for all these things and uh, he didn't survive but he needed a kidney transplant she couldn't she didn't give it she was feeling pain and she couldn't just get over the idea that i killed my brother i am telling me so i didn't give the thing then i worked with medicine with talking everything somewhere i got the bright idea to use the story of buddha and the pisang i told her the story which opened up a whole new you know the story of uh, the she goes with her uh, dead son and the buddha says go and get me some uh, oil or tindili from any house there is no death and she comes back and says everywhere there is then she says then she becomes his uh, disciple that made a break through and during to go so my core feeling is we need to look at it the same way when uh, krishna asked and they my sorry um, uh, sister sorry i'm not getting it uh, uh, what what do you want she said give me trouble so that i will be over you know this is a, this is not documented i'm sure like if, uh, if mother was standing here mother grandma 
she would quote things from the Bible, I am not so good at that. Similarly, my colleagues from Islam will quote things from there. Or Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism. You know, and I have included in that a whole series of uh, healing our minds lectures from the Dalai Lama Center in Delhi, which are going on these uh, days, where you see Sikhism, uh, Buddhism, all of them. Then we need to very big thing. We need to not do bodhane but sadhana. Sadhana don't say to go to the temple. You know, give them something, like say, right, Sri Ramajaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Or do this or you go on the tree the temple or the church or the mosque or something. So you convert the whole thing into an activity so that then most important thing is case studies. We are very poor at that. That's one of the reasons I showed a lot of books. In the West, if something happened, immediately they write a book. While here we, we have a whole of experience with us, but we don't know. Then we need to standardize spiritual practices so that people can practice it beyond obesity. Beyond obesity, they need to be able to practice it. Then of course, we must include psychiatric history, spiritual history to be part of it, not looked out upon spiritual practices as superstition, uh, retrograde, or uh, back project and things like that. And more important that we need to develop some uh, tools for measurement, longitudinal studies, impact processes and uh, all these things. Just imagine, in Bangalore we had about a million population being followed from say 2010, like the Harvard study. All of you have heard of Harvard study. They have been following people for the last 75 years and came up with the idea that connectedness is the best recipe for good health. If we had anything like that from 2010 and we are looking at their lifestyle practices, yoga, meditation, blah 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 and the pandemic occurred and you found what they have found cross-sectionally longitudinally people who are practitioners of this had less effect of the COVID what a great contribution to them would you agree with me on that? in point of fact I had suggested I am just saying to you the missed opportunities in 2017 to the then health minister Nadda and to the director of Nandala because the yoga thing had come up just then in 2015 Say, let us do that, bring art of living, yoga, yoga, yoga center, new hands, let's do that. We didn't do it. But I think we should think of developing this. At the, not only at the level of a million population, even at the level of the church. Look at things, when things happen, are there differences between people who have different levels of religiosity and spiritual ideas and how they practice it? Could we document it and reflect back to people? The same way we talk about obesity being contributing to one or the other, smoking being contributing to one or other, can we give credibility to these ideas so that people will own it up more easily than now? And of course, we do all of these things. We would be making three things. Number one, we would be giving power to the individuals. All the talk that we don't have enough resources disappears when each one of us becomes a resource. If I become my best doctor by using everything possible to be healthy, then the question of whether 7,000 psychiatrists, 70,000 psychiatrists, or 7 lakh psychiatrists doesn't matter. Number two, we are doing it something which will stay with the people forever, for lifetime. It is not for immediate particular illness or this one. Lastly, we would be bringing in much bigger societal level changes, what we call so, social capital, when people become spiritual, care for each other and concern for each other, so we will have a much better peaceful society. Next slide, yes. I come to the end of it. Of course, when you read the, the Western literature, they are very good at breaking down things. Like, can you shop for happiness? Can we do exercise for happiness and things like that? But in our country, I again and again say we have a rich resource of spirituality, spiritual knowledge, spiritual experiences, which in every religion that we need to harness and make it possible for other things. Next slide. Of course, lightheartedly people make fun of it, 
saying that you know, you can uh, have marks. But this bug is very good. Actually, I had ordered it. I thought I'll get it by today, but it didn't come. In one thing, all the things that you can do, think positively, move, everything is there in that bug. If only we can to make it an essential part of it, spirituality will become part of us and we will be inevitable. Next slide, please. I end up with a quote from uh, Pony, who does a monthly seminar, Duke University, freely available webinar, and uh, you have the link in the uh, paper, as they write to me. He says, the field of religion, spirituality, and health is growing rapidly. This was 2005. I dare to say, it's moving from periphery into the mainstream of healthcare. All health professionals should be familiar with the research base described in this paper. Know the reasons for indicating spirituality in patient care and be able to do so in a sensible and sensitive way. He concludes, at stake in the health and well-being of our patients and satisfaction that we as health care providers experience in delivering care that addresses the whole person, body, mind and spirit. Again, just to other things, hope, concern, guidance, shame. Everything is spiritual. And with these words, again I wish FPA all the success and uh, look forward to see the, the success of all of your work. Thank you again for this opportunity. Sir, Show me, please. please. Yes, I would request the viewers to put up your questions in the chat box so that you know uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy will be answering you. And also, you know, you people can ask it just directly on your screen. I would also request Dr. Srinivas Murthy to come on stage, please. I'm sure you will agree with me that we have listened to a very profound, powerful spiritual talk 
I don't think a psychiatrist, but a spiritual guru, if I go with that tradition. Very top top talk based on uh, India's religious traditions and spirituality. And uh, in general, the understanding of uh, religion's usefulness. And also the clinical uh, examples with which he has challenged us how spirituality is helpful in terms of health, individual, community, family, and even at the workplace. So, thank you very much. And I am sure you will have questions, something to supplement, and we will take about 20 minutes. And so, you can raise your hands and ask questions or then chat. You can chat, uh, watch it, and make questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mujita, Professor in the Department, formerly the Enhanced Department of Psychiatry Support. My association with the Professor Shiva's Mukti is for 40 years now. Uh, perhaps uh, this is the spirituality of the topic and mental health in general. Uh, what perhaps I learned from him, which will be very useful for all the practitioners in mental health and health, also have in us. And uh, today's world simply worked out like that. Uh, I mean, my remember memory is that uh, acceptance of the differences. Accepting the differences is the main cause for all the worldly problems. And uh, I still give a good the time. The road blocks for therapy is that simple principle of acceptance. This I learned from Professor Muti. That is, consider one down a road, perhaps taking the way I just put it at one down a road, and then from Professor Muti, that is, that is useful for me throughout my career in Enhance and the PhD, and as well as the professor. It's a simple thing to accept. How to accept? And one of the anecdotes he has mentioned in the PhD experience is a shared with me that only person with paranoid schizophrenia involved him in the information. If the person is not been informed about uh, these things, that will go. Suspicion becomes. Until then, what can you say that? I am a therapist, he is a patient. So that is the kind of parallel was there. And the parallel shift occurred with this little sharing and a lot of things. Lot of varieties of schizophrenia information and how to deal with them. I have learned simple thing is that I am a therapist concept arranged from my mind in early 1980 because of Professor Murphy. Even when he was in PT particular, I have a research consultation with Professor Murphy in terms of rehabilitation conditions in the early period. So that is the one thing. Second thing is how to make family to be involved as a therapist. That is the big question. 100% of the families say that huh? he or she is not family. We brought him, him, and you treat him. So, and that simple acceptance. How to make the family to involved as part of it? I asked a simple person. You brought X and Y to me, and you, do you think that at least 1% of your uh, share is there for this uh, uh, situation? And yes. And uh, that is how we say that uh, making involving the family. There is a lot of anecdotes, but the time is not sufficient. And the uh, simple principle of acceptance of this thing, accepting that we are not we are not solvers, we are only facilitators. So this concept I have learned from Professor Shima's working that is very helpful. But at the same time, the first principle of social work, professional social work, is principle of acceptance, right? And this is what we are not. We are not God. We can facilitate. What that is all technically in conventional science so or in mental field is called wonder language. You are not solving. Go to that level and then make it happen. That's uh, we really. I agree with Professor Mohan Isaac's uh, comments 
and uh, uh, Jacob Jones uh, initial remarks about your presentation and uh, this will be helpful for me for the future in terms of spirituality management. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Can I? Yes, of course. Now, well, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk. But my question is basic. What do you mean by spirituality? How you define? I remember reading that Virata, the Bhadi, was very spiritual. He would always pray before he went out for his effort. Because this word is bad for Spiritual. Spiritual. How do you define that? Thank you. I think you better have Good evening, sir. We are extremely grateful to you for the great lecture on spirituality and mental health. In fact, this is a great opportunity. India is looking for such kind of the services. We are extremely grateful to the Medical Park Association. The first NGO is going to be a for the number of persons with mental disorders. Today, they are opening up the third process. It's a great eye opening research for the world on behalf of the Department of Psychiatry and the entire campus of the Nats. We are extremely grateful to the Rico Pass Organization and our country of sincere duty to the entire team. And we pray for their good work to continue this work for many more medical centuries in the world. And I have one question to the Rico Pass Organization, the order, how the disciplined medical professionals can take up the incorporation of spiritual related dimensions in our working field. Thank you so much, sir. The two questions of the chat box. Um, one is how, sir, how do we integrate effectively mental health and spirituality in PG curriculum? One. Sir, I need to know how a rationalist of the peace can find talk in a binary process. Insightful session. In what way can someone experience practice spirituality without being in peace? Sergeant, I am asked for speak now. Sergeant, unmute and speak. Yes, good evening. Am I with you? Hello, am I with you? Hello, am I with you? Hello, speak one, two, three, am I with you?
from the other club, beautiful stories from the other club. And I found all of these things, uh, these amazing stories from the Pagoda Club, stories of Nutu, stories from Ramanabashi, as well as stories from uh, the Bible and the, uh, the, the Quran and the Hadith. They were very inspiring and uh, allowing me to kind of uh, overcome uh, the crisis situation. So my question really is, ever since I've been benefiting from uh, the tremendous value from these beautiful stories, I've always wanted to do something, you know. Uh, and, and because something needs to be evidence-based, because already, I mean, like you rightly pointed out, generally when you talk about spirituality and mental health, what is the general notion that you know, this is all mumbo jumbo uh, and hacky and stuff like that. So if there's something evidence-based that we can do, then that seems more convincing to people. So, um, so I, I was just thinking, you know, how can I kind of involve, how can I start my own initiative uh, in, this, in this field based on the fact that I have a very powerful lived experience that to talk about. So I have a long question. Thank you once again for the wonderful talk. So I am suffering from uh, multiple personal disorder, uh, uh, which is still from uh, two decades, no, not good. So we No, it's a, the central question that many of you have raised is how do you differentiate between religion and spirituality? Should we do it or not? Each one of us will have different opinion. My own personal feeling is spirituality functions at three levels belief, practices, and philosophy. It is different people will use. Like water can be ice cubes, liquid, or gas. Philosophy is like gas. Every day go everywhere, get into problems. While most of us are comfortable with the solid ice form, that is the belief. I believe in it. My good personal feeling is that uh, to answer many of the questions, it is moving ourselves away from the preoccupation with the body and I, like Ramana Maharshi says. Who am I? You know, the minute you keep asking this question, same thing question about JK takes you to a higher level of thought process. You know, I am simplifying things uh, to get across. My own personal feeling is the question which uh, you asked about how do you include it in the PG curriculum? All that we need to do, like I did it, I tell you another uh, small story. When I went to Shankara Cancer Hospital and said, Look, I'll give my three services because I want to. Learn from myself. There was a psychiatrist who and a social worker. Dr. Murthy, why are you coming? No one comes to us. And by the time I left to stop working, I would have been working 24 hours a day. Because if you are expecting a deviancy model to come to you, saying that I have anxiety and depression, no. If you ask, how are you addressing your problem? What can we do to strengthen your things? What are the questions that you are asking? Then the problem is turned around in a different manner. That's what really happened with our caregivers of uh, development disabilities. These two young girls were very upset with me. I said, You don't worry about it. You know, just ask them what helped them, what helped them. Then they came up with such story. They said, My God, we never heard this thing before. So, my whole answer to all my questions is that please think of not the divisions between the religions because if you look at totality every one of them talk about connection with the higher power if you recognize that you are one of the billions of organisms in this world immediately most of our problems disappear all of our anxiety is about death and other things 
Now, similarly, if you recognize that your well being depends on the well being of others, other well being also depends on you, your uh, problems of conflict and other things become this. My own answer is please don't go by the dogma, go by the spirit of it. Spirit is the real sense of the spirit, not spiritual aspect of the things. Then you will find the answers. And don't look for the answers from outside, look for the answers from within. Ultimately, you know, Swami Raghunathan Gandhi was asked, How do you manage things? He says, When I open my eyes, I see what I can do for others. When I close my eyes, I see what can I do, see inside. So I am being a little uh, clever, but I think ultimately we all are looking for that peace within. And if we recognize it and work on it, many of the problems will be solved. Thank you very much. We understand the uh, Dr. Arthur Jabal, President of the Psychiatric Association with the audience on the online platform. Sir, do you have anything to say, any comments, any questions to our speaker? Please unmute. Uh, what a nice and excellent presentation. 
making so many clarifications about this complicated and complex subject. I was just wondering that uh, this is the appropriate time that we can use your good offices to advise World Academic Association. How can we ensure the inclusion of this particular topic specifically in our postgraduate training programs? I know that India is a uh, hub of spirituality, but this is the right time that we should share this experience and expertise, specifically in those countries who have got low resource, low income, and less chances for uh, incorporating changes in the curriculum, for the, uh, especially for the trainees and tra trainees in mental health. WPA will be highly obliged for your guidance. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice of you to join us and also to raise this question. I don't want to be simplistic, but I want to say I learned all my spirituality during my undergraduate days in CLC level. Not because they taught me, because they did it by practice. I can quote Dr. Pulemu, Dr. Waki, Dr. Garde, I can quote it, Dr. Burgess. Let me just give you one example. When Dr. Burgess was retiring, I was there as an example. I said, Do you worry about what will happen to the department? You are leaving? No, Muti, I don't worry. God is there, God will take He said it, I mean, I still remember it even after 30 years. You know, so I think the most important thing is for each one of us to realize our spirituality and practice it in our work so that it gets percolated into the world. That's the way I see it. Of course, at an academic level, uh, I will write to you separately and I'll share with you what can be done in this area. Thank you very much, Dr. Javed. Very nice of you to join us. I will I'm glad you all agree with me that we had a very, very enriching evening with this. Lecture on spirituality and health, physical health, mental health, emotional health, health in all its aspects. Individuals, families, communities, and workplaces. And uh, Dr. has brought us to the challenge that we need to return to authentic spirituality as we practice in India in order to maintain health in India individuals, communities across religious tradition. The question religiosity and spirituality is important. Religiosity is what I do with my big tradition of Sunday Golden Church. That is religious. Spirituality is this coining, we have explained somewhere, spirituality is the level of maturity, mental, emotional, social maturity short in everyday life. So there is a difference between religiosity and spirituality. There are some people who are very religious, but spirituality is not any close to them. There are some people who say that we are not, I am not religious, but there is spirituality in them, I accept when they show that in their behavior. So this is a challenge for all of us to protect our religious traditions and spirituality specifically and go back and then we chose to something so, so that this lecture that was to have a, a, a new beginning. It is a Ronald W. Winnicott, a psychiatrist and a pediatrician and psychiatrist talk about the transitional phenomenon, religious experience as a transitional And that the transitional phenomenon he meant. There is a, there is a third area of experience. Objective, which is here, subjective up there, which is what I say, my own experience. But in between, something happens to body and mind, and that is the transitional. This is all what our speaker has been, has been sharing with us today, and we are blessed with your talk, Dr. Murthy, God bless you, and continue to be part of MBA and our work. Thank you.
Okay. I express my gratitude to the Academic Public Services and Publication Chairperson, Ms. Ellen Shinde, for all her initiatives. Let me take the opportunity to thank Michael Apps, Mr. Ganesh, and his team for standing by us whenever we need. I would also thank Jessica Levens for helping us with the online streaming, without which the concept of hybrid wouldn't have been possible. Our gratitude to SJP Enterprises for the openings and Mr. Selvaraj for providing us with the power bank. My thanks to all our residents who are the very purpose of NPA. <laughs> Last but not the least, my sincere thanks to all the staff members for the relentless efforts in everything we do. It would not have been possible without you all. Once again, a thank you to all and wish you a very warm evening. Thank you. Well, just before we go, uh, I would like to tell all the viewers that this recording of this entire session will be made available, and uh, whoever is willing to, uh, I don't know, want the link to the recording can write to the MP office. That is Medico Pastoral Association at the rate gmail.com. Medico Pastoral Association at the rate gmail.com, so that the recording will be sent to you. Um, and one more request is that, you know, uh, we will be putting the same link on our YouTube channel. So, please, whenever you go to YouTube channel, please subscribe so that, you know, we get more subscribe. Thank you so much. Until the next lecture series, I thank one and all who are present here and who joined us from different parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you again.